Annyeong haseyo. Good morning. My name is Scott Lamb. I'm the vice president for international at BuzzFeed. Um, because I work at BuzzFeed, I'm now obligated to take a selfie um, with you guys in the background. So if you're in the front, if you can just smile for the photograph really quickly, that would be great. Up. Oh. Technical difficulties. Let me try it again. All right, one, two, three, smile big. Good work. All right, thank you. I just need to tweet that out. Give me one second. Um, I'm very honored to be here uh, speaking to you today as a part of the as SDF. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the tweet is up. Thank you. I want to thank SBS for inviting me. It's a huge honor to be here, my first time in Korea, uh, learning a lot about the media market in Korea. Um, my topic today is uh, scaling creativity, and I've tried to learn this to make it really clear to the audience what it is in Korean, so let me know how this goes. Chang uh, Wee Sung, Hwak Jang Hagi. How did I do? Is that okay? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I've been with BuzzFeed since 2007, so just about the time that the site began. And for, for BuzzFeed, this theme of conscious curiosity has been central to everything that we've done and how we've been successful over the years. So I want to talk about how we've scaled creativity at BuzzFeed um, and made it successful. Um, I hope that some of the lessons that we've learned can be helpful to you in whatever business you're in. Um, I think they can be applicable to media, but I think a wide range of other activities as well. So to start, um, this was what BuzzFeed.com looked like back in 2007. Um, it was very simple. The web was a much simpler place back then as well. Um, and we were just a tiny startup. There were five of us in an office in Chinatown in New York City. Uh, we only published about six stories every day, so it was very, you know, not a, not a lot going up on the site. And we had a pretty modest readership of about 200,000 unique visitors a month. Um, you know, the, the web was very simple. I think a couple of the speakers have referred to this today of the, the incredibly fast pace of change online. Um, so when BuzzFeed started, Twitter had just begun. Facebook was still really only for American college students. Uh, and the way that we use the web was totally different than it is today. So fast forward to 2015, and BuzzFeed is one of the largest publishers online. We have about 200 million monthly unique visitors to the site. Our video team now gets about a billion monthly video views. They've been growing like crazy. Um, and we have almost 1,000 employees uh, around the globe. So I think the big question is, how did BuzzFeed go from then to now? How were we able to grow so quickly? Um, and I think a big part of the answer to that is conscious curiosity um, and the way that we have scaled the creative approach that we had at BuzzFeed into something much, much larger. Um, one of, the, one of the big differences between BuzzFeed and I think a traditional media company is that we, we don't have pitch meetings. Um, we instead rely on brainstorming and iteration. Our, our basic strategy has been to hire creative, smart people and let them do creative, smart things. So the question then becomes, how do you structure groups like that? If it's not a rigid hierarchy, how do you have them all working together? And for BuzzFeed, what we've done is had small groups of people um, with a very clear mission. Uh, those missions can vary from uh, doing humor content to doing parenting uh, to working on long-form magazine-style journalism. But having a really clear and focused mission allows these groups within BuzzFeed to work independently. Um, one way to think about BuzzFeed is not even really like a media company. In some ways, we're, we're like a scientific laboratory. And when we began, we had these theories about how people might use content in the era of social media. Um, one of those theories was they don't just want to consume content, they also want to use it to express themselves and connect with other people. So our, we had these theories and we would use content to test them out. How do people share content? How does the, the change in tone of something that you've made change the way that people share? That experimental background has been essential to BuzzFeed from the very, very beginning. Um, another thing that I think has been very successful for us and, and very, um, you know, in our favor, is that the web is a very forgiving publishing platform. We at BuzzFeed developed something that we call the mullet strategy. Um, and I don't mean the type of fish. Mullet is the uh, American word for this type of haircut where it's short in the front and long in the back that was big like in the 80s. But it also, I think, 
has come to symbolize how BuzzFeed published in its early days, that on the front page of the site, we had only the best stuff that was happening on BuzzFeed appear. In the background, our writers were able to create lots of different types of content without fear of failure and without fear of clogging up the home page. Um, you know, the web, as it, it's expanded, one of the really great advantages it has as a form for, for creating media is that there's a lot of space. If you are in traditional broadcast, if you have a TV station or a newspaper, there is a constraint on space. And to be successful, you need to have a very high hit rate. On the web, there's a lot more room for experimentation and honestly a lot more room for failure. And that's been, I think, in BuzzFeed's favor. Um, so over the years, uh, since, since the early days of the site, we have sort of developed, I would say, five core principles that have allowed us to scale creatively as we've grown. And I want to talk through those today. Um, the first one is to iterate in the, in the direction of success. And this is really at the core of BuzzFeed's model. We like to start small, test out a lot of ideas, get data back, learn from that data, and continue that process. And that's how we grow. Um, as an example of this, I want to talk about I think BuzzFeed's most well-known and enduring format, The List. You, I'm sure if you're familiar with BuzzFeed at all, you're familiar with posts like the 30 most important cats of 2015. That is our bread and butter. That's a big part of what we publish on the site. But it, you know, it took us a long time to get there. We didn't start out doing those types of lists. And of course, BuzzFeed didn't invent lists. They have been around really since the beginning of written human language. They are a very useful way to structure information um, in a written form so that we can understand it. We got to our lists, our understanding of lists, very organically by trial and error and trying out a lot of different types of things on BuzzFeed. And it really changed when we were able to add images and media to the posts on BuzzFeed in our publishing platform. Originally, BuzzFeed was just, any BuzzFeed story was just a list of links to other places. We would find an interesting topic and create a list of links that would go somewhere else. But once we added the ability to add images and video, we started discovering that lists could be secretly a great way to tell stories. So this was one of our first big successes of a list post, um, 40 Things That Will Make You Feel Old. Had about 6 million views, which was pretty big for us back in 2011 when it came out. And when you look at this, it's not just a list of dis distinct items. It's actually telling a story. Um, and that story is that it's horrible to grow old, which we can all identify with, um, especially I'm now 39. This really resonates with, with me in a big way. Um, it told a story which is, is a big part of the human condition. And in a funny way, the idea of imagining Bart Simpson at age 36 is kind of horrifying. Um, so it, it, it taught us a new way about storytelling. Another early example um, of this for BuzzFeed was this post, um, The Worst Things About Being Left-Handed. Also a big success. It had about 10 million views. And it was the first time that we realized that you could add telling stories about identity to list posts. Um, and that would be really powerful and resonate with people. Um, so from there, we had a team who was focused on lists and were trying out all these different ideas. And so they, I, they realized identity was very powerful and emotion was a big powerful driver as a way of telling stories with lists. And they kept experimenting from there, realizing that under identity, uh, you could have local and regional identity. Under emotion, you could have positive and negative emotion. And they kept experimenting and going in the direction of, of success and finding new and different ways to tell stories with lists. Um, so that's the, that's the first principle for us. I think what, we, what you see from this diagram is that it went off in all sorts of different directions. But one of the things that we've learned over the years at BuzzFeed as well is that sometimes having that much freedom uh, can be overwhelming when you're trying to do something creative. So our second core principle is to work within constraints. Um, Twitter as a platform has proven this idea that sometimes to make creativity happen, you need to actually restrict the available means of communication. Um, so one of the things that we do at BuzzFeed, I mentioned earlier, we don't have pitch meetings for our writers. We also don't have quotas. So any given writer at BuzzFeed isn't responsible for doing a certain number of posts in a day. And we do this on purpose. We think it makes people better, more creative writers. Um, but it also can lead to a situation where writers, because they're perfectionists, are thinking more about this cool idea that they have in their head than actually making something real. Um, that, that process of taking something from an idea into reality can be very painful. So we came up with a, a strategy to sort of push our, our writers to be more creative and more productive, and we borrowed it from the world of software development. Um, it's called sprints. So a sprint at BuzzFeed can last a day, it can be a week, 
But basically, the idea is that a team of writers get together and they push themselves to come up with as many good stories as they can in a constrained amount of time. Um, they need to be good stories. It's still important that our writers are creating very high quality viral content, but they have to do it in this sort of condensed way where they're all working together as a team. And what we found is that often pushes them to be more creative and come up with better ideas than they would just on their own. Um, time is a really interesting variable to play with when you're thinking about creativity. Um, so that actually leads to our, our third sort of core creative principle, to choose a single variable to focus on. Um, as a good example of this, um, I want to talk about a, a team that we made at BuzzFeed back in 2012 that was focused very much on one platform, which is Pinterest. Um, Pinterest is huge in the US. I think uh, they have about 70 million users worldwide. I don't know if they're very popular in Korea. But they, they started in 2010 and grew very, very, very quickly. So at BuzzFeed, we were looking at their success, and we noticed that on Pinterest, all of the content is made up of content from somewhere else. So we thought if we could figure out how to make content for users on Pinterest, that would be hugely successful. So we started a group called the Pin Ops Group, uh, the Pinterest Operations Group. And their single mission, the thing that they focused on um, solely, was how to make something go viral on Pinterest. Um, one editor in particular got totally obsessed with this idea. She lived in the network. She spent all of her time on there. And um, after a couple months of experimentation and iteration, she came up with this, which was our first big successful Pinterest post, uh, 31 insanely easy and clever DIY projects. Um, it's a super fun post. It got about 16 million views. Much, much of that sharing came from Pinterest. And <clears throat> it wasn't just this one-off post that she'd created. She actually discovered a way of creating content for Pinterest. And that led to something even bigger than successful posts, which we love. Um, it really informed a big part of how BuzzFeed is and operates now. Um, one of our three main editorial divisions at BuzzFeed is BuzzFeed Life. And the same editor who understood Pinterest now uh, co-runs BuzzFeed Life. It's one of the fastest growing segments on the site. Pinterest has also become BuzzFeed's number two source of social referral traffic after Facebook. So it's above Twitter in terms of sending traffic to BuzzFeed, which for publishers is very unusual. Um, I think this story of how this little group of people and this one editor in particular grew into this larger part of BuzzFeed also exemplifies the, the fourth principle I want to talk about, which is scale based on success. Um, one of the things that I think people often misunderstand about BuzzFeed is that we have some sort of viral algorithm that tells us what, what stories are going to go crazy. I wish. It would make my life very easy. Um, we do, though, have a formula, but it's not about prediction. It's about seeing and ranking how things, after they've been published, how they're taking off. Um, so get your camera phones ready. This is about as close to a secret formula as you'll see in this presentation. Um, this is our social rank. Um, <clears throat> so in this, um, R equals traffic. Beta, the little squiggly sign, equals the likelihood of someone sharing the, the piece of content. And Z is just the number of people who come across it. It's pretty basic. It's the, the rank that we assign anything that gets published on BuzzFeed, be it uh, a story by one of our writers um, or a piece of advertising published by our creative team. And it just basically allows us to say, look, this thing is really taking off. And in a very simple way, it allows us to maximize content spread. So it, it runs all of the optimization that happens on the site. Um, as a sort of real world example of the same sort of thinking about putting a lot of your resources towards things that are doing well, um, I want to talk about this, which is our most successful post in history. Um, what state do you actually belong in? Very simple, kind of silly quiz um, that would tell you which American state you should actually be living in. Um, the editors that wrote this, you know, they had a good chance, they had a good feeling that it was going to be big, but they never thought it would be as big as it, it was, over 40 million views. But what was interesting about this was also sort of like the, the social rank algorithm. We couldn't have seen it beforehand, but it's actually helped shape where we've gone in the future. So after the success of this post, we created a quiz team at BuzzFeed that was very focused on making quizzes and doing that same sort of experimental work. Um, they still exist today, even though the mania for quizzes has cooled off a little bit. But because of their work um, and because of our refocusing towards seeing this massive success with quizzes, the quiz page on BuzzFeed is now one of the most popular destinations on the site after the home page. Um, so as a last point, and this is something that I've mentioned, I think, in, in all of these earlier things, um, it's really important for, for BuzzFeed to use data. Um, so our, our fifth sort of 
core creative principle for scaling creativity is to let data be your friend. And again, I know I'm talking a lot about BuzzFeed very specifically, because that's my experience. Um, I think this notion is widely applicable to any, time, any type of media that you're working in, uh, really any time you're working with ideas. So for BuzzFeed, this, this, this loop of of data and feedback is at the core of what we do on the editorial team, also on the technology team, also on our advertising team. Um, so much so that now our CEO, Jonah Peretti, likes to talk about BuzzFeed as being a network integrated media company, which I don't know entirely what that means, but this is the, the drawing that he made on the back of a napkin to sort of explain it. Um, and basically, on the one side, you have people making stuff, uh, coming up with ideas, coming up with videos, making posts. And then there are the places that those things live, on the web, on apps, um, or on distributed platforms like Buzz, uh, sorry, Facebook instant articles. And the idea is that we create stuff, we send it out into the world, and we get data back. And we learn from that, and we do it over and over and over again. We could only do that if by, by owning a lot of it and really understanding a lot of the data that happens on BuzzFeed.com. It's one of the reasons we have a very large software engineering team at BuzzFeed. We have our own CMS, our own ad serving platform, um, and we own a lot of our own data. So for any piece of content on BuzzFeed, we create a social dashboard. Um, so the, the writer can see immediately where traffic is coming from, where it's being shared, how users are interacting with the thing that they've made. Um, as another example of this, we have a, a, a basically a headline optimizer. Um, so a writer on BuzzFeed, when they make a post, they have a great story. They can write as many different versions of a headline as they want and then A-B test them against one another. Um, this is great for traffic. It certainly helps optimize its traffic. But <clears throat> I think even more importantly, it allows writers to get better and better at what they do, to get a better and deeper understanding of how to write a good headline. Um, so to, to end, I think it's my sort of last example. I want to point to a post that happened earlier this year that I think really encapsulates a lot of the work in the direction of conscious curiosity and scaled creativity that we do at BuzzFeed. Um, and that's the dress, which I assume a lot of people here are familiar with. One of our biggest posts of all time, it was an instant, instant viral phenomenon, um, almost 40 million views. And the, the writer at BuzzFeed who posted it, it's not like she knew this was going to be a huge thing. She had a gut feeling, and it was based totally on her years of experience at BuzzFeed, and also the fact that when she looked at this photo, someone else walked by, and they immediately got into an argument about what color the dress was. So she thought, aha, this is going to be big. Um, in the aftermath of publishing the dress, a lot of publishers in the US were asking themselves, how can we recreate this? How can we do what BuzzFeed has done? Um, and the American writer and programmer Paul Ford, uh, I think, wrote a very nice response to this. And his answer to publishers who wanted to recreate the dress was basically this. Uh, hire tons of people, let them experiment, experiment, figure out how social media works, and repeat endlessly with lots of snacks. Robots didn't make this happen. It was a hint of magic and some science. And I think that notion, a, a bit of magic and a bit of science, is essentially what BuzzFeed is and does. So thank you so much.